Once again, good evening, everyone. Honorable dignitaries of the day, Reverend Father Rajipi Kurin, Principal, St. Berkman's College, Professor Ravi Srivastav, Director, Center for Employment Studies, Institute for Human Development, Delhi, Dr. Vijay Sebastian, Retired Associate Professor, Institute of Management Technology, Ghaziabad, teachers, and my dear students. We are here today to celebrate the life and legacy of one of our beloved teachers, Professor Caesar Skaria, a pioneering figure in economic studies in Kerala. Professor Skaria joined the Department of Economics at St. Berkman's College in the year 1949 and became its head in 1967. With remarkable intellect, sharp wit, deep scholarship, and keen vision, he mentored generations of students, which include dominant politicians, bureaucrats, and economists. A gifted teacher and eloquent orator, he communicated effectively on any topic with his magical eloquence. He also connected with the leading economists of his time, such as John Robinson, Kane Raj, and I.S. Gulati, and brought them to the department. Professor Skaria held the rare honor of being the member of both Senate and Syndicate of the University of Kerala from 1960 to 1984. He was also a member and chairman of academic bodies at the universities of Kerala, Calicut, and Madras. He tirelessly fought for the rights and dignity of private college teachers in Kerala. A multifaceted genius with interest in acting, music, oratory, and agriculture, he was a great educationist, visionary, and institution builder. Above all, he was a warm and affectionate human being. Professor Caesar Skaria passed away on 7th March 2000. This lecture series was instituted in honor of Professor Caesar Skaria, first as Professor Caesar Skaria Shashtyabdapurti Memorial Lecture, in 1988, and later from the year 2000 as Professor Caesar Skaria Memorial Lecture. We have been fortunate to have eminent academicians such as I.S. Gulati, Ole Tonquist, Amit Bhaduri, Pulepre Balakrishnan, D. Narasim Haradi, etc. as resource persons. This year's lecture marks the 36th in the series. First and foremost, I cordially welcome our dear principal, Reverend Father Rajiv Pikurian, who is the president of this gathering. He needs no introduction here. I'm glad to say here that he is a constant source of inspiration for all the initiatives of our department. Hearty welcome, dear father. For this year's lecture, we have among us an illustrious academician, Professor Ravi Srivastav who is the director of the Center for Employment Studies at the Institute for Human Development, Delhi. Previously, he was a professor of economics and chairperson of the Center for the Study of Regional Development at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and a full-time member of the National Commission for Enterprises in the unorganized sector with the rank of Secretary, Government of India. Professor Srivastav's research focuses on labor and employment, migration, social protection, agriculture, rural development and rural poverty, the informal sector, regional development, decentralization, human development, and land reforms. His innovative work combining qualitative and quantitative methods has significantly advanced the understanding of poverty and development in India. He has authored five books, four monographs, and over a hundred research papers, and led over 25 major research projects funded by entities like UNICEF, ILO, and the World Bank. He has received numerous awards, including the Commonwealth and Fulbright Fellowships, and the B.B. Giri Memorial Award for his work on labor migration. Professor Srivastav has also contributed to academic governance and served in advisory roles for various governmental and international agencies. Notably, 
His work with NCEUS led to the Unorganized Workers Social Security Act 2008 and the Rashtriya Swasthya Bhima Yojana, supporting millions of poor families. Beyond his impressive academic record, I'm privileged to introduce Professor Srivastav as a teacher, guide, and mentor. He is incredibly approachable and dedicated to supporting students in their academic pursuits. I have personally experienced his support as my research guide during my PhD thesis preparation and defense at the Center for the Study of Regional Development, JNU, New Delhi. Above all, he's a teacher with a great heart. Dear sir, with a lot of affection and happiness, I welcome you to the Professor C. Satskaria Memorial Lecture 2023-24. To share, with the, to share with us the fond memories of Professor C. Satskaria, we have among us Dr. V.G. Sebastian, retired associate professor, Institute of Management Technology, Ghaziabad, who is our distinguished alumni of MA Economics 1984-86 batch. Hearty welcome, dear sir, to this August gathering. I proudly welcome Anjali Elizabeth Joy, and Aksa Mary, Mary Skaria and Mary George to this gathering, who are the recipients of Professor Caesar Skaria Memorial Awards for Choppers in the MA Economics program during the last academic year. Hearty welcome, dears. Hearty welcome to our former teachers of the department who have been instrumental in the formation of our students over many decades. I also welcome the family members of Professor C. Satskaria to this gathering. I gratefully acknowledge the efforts of our teachers and students in the department to gather together all the arrangements for the lecture today. Had to welcome all my dear colleagues and my dear students to this gathering. Finally, I welcome all the other participants of the lecture, teachers and students from other departments of the college and institutions Around the, around the college and our dear alumni of the college. Once again, welcoming you all, I remain. Wish you all a highly engaging session today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Reverend Father Reggie Pikurian, our beloved principal, has always provided encouragement and support for all departmental endures. He consistently makes time to join us for all the events. His words of inspiration and his presence are very essential. Father, we appreciate you being here and preside over the meeting. We sincerely welcome Reverend Father Reggie Pikurian to give the presidential speech. Thank you, Sneha. Respected Professor Revi Srivastava, the resource person for the 36th Professor C. S. Karia Memorial Lecture 2023-24, Dr. Shinu Waki, the head of the department, Economics, Professor V.J. Sebastian, who is fondly remembering Professor C. S. Karia, respected faculty members, alumni members of the Department of Economics, former professors from the Department of Economics, other invited members, especially the family members of Professor Caesar Scaria and my dear loving students. Good evening all. At this time, St. Bergman's College community also remembers Professor Caesar Scaria, the great teacher and leader who made the department one of the great departments of that time at par with leading university departments for more than that. Also, the college gratefully thank Professor Devi Srivastava for sharing your academic expertise with the students of St. Bergman's College community. And we are happy to hear that you are 
the research guide of Dr. Shinu Waki, our beloved head of the department. We are very thankful to you for guiding our head of the department in his doctoral studies. Also, I take this opportunity to congratulate dear loving students who, who are awarded with Professor C. S. S. Korea Memorial Medals. Our nation has just finished the parliament election and a government under Mr. Narendra Modi ji has won him just four days back. A country having the largest number of young people. Not only that, the, la the largest number of population has the potency to lead the world tomorrow. If we prepare our youth in the proper way, or our human resources may be channelized in the proper way. Here comes the role of governments. Through making timely and effective policies. But we all have noticed that during the election campaign, our major political parties didn't address many of its, many of our nation's major issues. I think it is all. The level of unemployment I have read in some newspaper that after the independence has increased or reached its highest percentage. And I am sure as a developing nation, it is not a good sign for India. But we are sure that our democracy is very strong. And I hope our nation standing together will overcome the present situation. And I hope that India will be able to provide more employment opportunities and thus kindle more hope in the minds of our youth. I am sure that this memorial lecture will give you more light about the facts of the present situation and how can we, we, we be more hopeful or how can our government give more hope to our young people. I wish all of you a very good time with Professor Dr. Devi Srivastava, who is one of the resource, most respected resource persons in this area. I wish all of you to have a fruitful time. I remain. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Wherever a beautiful soul has been, there has been a trail of memories. I would like to invite Dr. Vijay Sebastian, retired associate professor, economic environment and policy, Institute of Management Technology, Ghaziabad, who has been the former student of late Professor CZ Skaria to share his memories of his beloved teacher. Thank you, Ms. Mira. Uh, could you confirm if I am audible? Yes, sir. Yes, I am audible. Thank you. A respected Principal Father Reggie P. Kurin, Head of the Department, Dr. Shinu Waki, Esteemed Keynote Speaker, Professor Ravi Srivastavji, Coordinator, Dr. Anila Skaria, family members of Dr. C. Sert's career, current and former faculty members, alumni and students of the department, ladies and gentlemen. A very good evening to all of you. I consider it both an honor and a privilege to join you all today and share my memories of Professor C. Sert's career, a remarkable educator and mentor. 
let me also uh, say that in no way I am competent to speak on the vast contributions of Professor Caesar to the academic community, to the economic department, uh, and uh, SB College in general. They are all well known to all of us and are also mentioned by Dr. Shinuvaki uh, just now. I would therefore restrict myself to recollecting my own personal memories and experiences as a student of Professor Caesar's career. Now, hailing from a from Bharnanganam, a place about 50 kilometers away from Changnashiri, I had a number of options for doing my post-graduation in economics closer to my home. We had a St. Thomas College, Pali, K College, Mananam, St. Dominic's College, Kanyarapalli. Besides, there were the uh, government colleges also. It was the reputation of the Department of Economics at SB College which attracted me to this college and that reputation was to a large extent due to the eminent professors of the uh, department like Professor C. Sert's career, Professor T.V. Abraham, Professor K.K. Francis, among others. I would say Professor C. Sert's career was really like the icing on the cake, highly acclaimed all across the academic community of the state and outside, uh, a real stalwart he was. As we have all uh, uh, heard, he was a great orator and communicated the subject in impeccable English. He taught us microeconomics and his classes were marked by his great sense of humor and uh, practical examples, which made learning an easier and an enjoyable experience for all of us, uh, his students. Sir had a very pleasant nature and always had a smile on his face and was full of affection for his students. I never seen him getting angry, losing his temper or scolding anybody. Now, what I remember, sir, the most is for the mentoring and guidance I received. Some of which I would uh, try to recollect here. Uh, we had a different uh, combinations of electives which we had to choose uh, while uh, doing MA. I remember at that time of admission, I asking sir about this and uh, the words were smart like, we have different boxes of offerings. And when you choose one, you opt all the uh, courses in that box. And he proceeded to explain to me uh, the benefit and disadvantage of each of the boxes that I could uh, uh, select. Now, a uh, second uh, aspect I remember is that he also guided me on how to really prepare for the university exam. He asked me to study directly from the prescribed textbooks and told me to buy them if possible and even suggested where I could uh, get them. There was a bookshop in Kottayam called Paiko. Uh, I do not know whether it is still there. So after a copy of the syllabus was given to us, I went to that particular shop and purchased one textbook each for main subjects like microeconomics, macroeconomics, and uh, international economics, which, were, which was an elective course for me. Of these, one on my macroeconomics by Edward Shapiro, I refer to that even now while teaching macroeconomics to my MBA students. The same copy is there uh, with me even now. We used to have a Viva Voci exam in the second year. And for that, there used to be a mock Viva also to train the students. In spite of all that efforts, I made major blunders in my final Viva Voci exam. And some of my answers were really confusing. After the event, uh, sir asked me, what happened to you? Now, essentially what was happening was, I make an initial statement in my answer. And that statement I had to change one or more times where the end of my answer at the conclusion was not really tallying with my initial assertion. 
then I remember answering to sir that in a written paper, I can always cancel and change my answer if I feel they were wrong. But while speaking, it is not easy or rather it is uh, impossible to uh, change sentences in between creating confusion. Now, Professor Caesar Scarius advice to me on this was try to be more articulate in your thought and in what you speak. And I think an advice which uh, uh, always uh, carry uh, uh, st stand always. Now, our batch uh, that passed out in 1986 was perhaps the second batch of ME under uh, Mahatma Gandhi University. I remember that MG University at that time did not have research facilities as it was a new university. Therefore, uh, when I had to apply for an MPhil course, I had to approach the University of Kerala in Trivandrum. Now, Professor Scaria helped me by suggesting few topics uh, on which I could uh, prepare a short research proposal and discussed various aspects of uh, these topics. Also issued recommendation letters to me. I think he did same for a few other uh, uh, batchmates also. Unfortunately, I was not selected. I think the university preferred to select uh, their own students. It would be interesting to know even professors from other colleges were keen to know uh, what was being taught in our MA classes. I would specifically refer to HOD of the Department of Economics at K College at uh, that time who happened to be uh, from my own parish, uh, used to visit my home every now and then and collect the class notes, which were uh, subjects taught by Professor C. Sertzkaria, Professor K.K. Francis, and Professor T.B. Abraham, uh, especially. After I secured a uh, first rank in the university, I remember going to Professor C. Sert's home pers to personally thank him for all his guidance. And I met Professor Caesar the last time in 1993 uh, when I went to invite him for my wedding. Surprisingly, he, he knew the girl's family very well. And I remember him telling me, oh, it is indeed a good alliance and giving me uh, his uh, good wishes. Today, as we remember and celebrate Professor C. Sertzkaria's incredible life and legacy, uh, I offer my homage to uh, his memory and congratulate the college for regularly uh, hosting this memorial lecture. Before I conclude, uh, I thank Dr. Anila and the principal, Father Reggie Kurian, for having given me this opportunity uh, to share my memories about Professor C. Sert's career. I also take this opportunity to congratulate all the Rhine holders who are being felicitated today. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, sir. Professor Ravi Srivastava is currently the director of the Center for Employment Studies at the Institute for Human Development in Delhi. He has authorized six books, five monographs, over 110 papers, and conducted over 35 major research projects for agencies like UNICEF, ILO, World Bank, and others. He has advised the Planning Commission, Indian Union Ministries, state governments, and international agencies. He served as the president of the Indian Society of Labor Economics and is currently the president of the Uttar Pradesh Uttarakhand Economics Association. As unemployment is a burning issue in the current scenario, today we have with us Professor Ravi Srivastava to deliver the lecture on the topic, The Challenge of Employment. With due respect, we welcome you, sir, to take over the session. It's a pleasure uh, to, be, to be at St. Bachman's College, even though remotely, and to have the opportunity of giving this memorial lecture in honor of uh, Professor Skaria. Uh, uh, and to be in the presence of this August company. Uh, thank you, Father, for your nice words. Uh, Professor Sebastian, for bringing alive the memory of Professor Sakaria. 
Uh, I know that Professor Philip, I, I visited uh, St. Bishman's College about five years ago, and Professor Philip was then uh, the head of department. Uh, I know he's in the audience today, along with a large number of other people in, and the family members of Professor Scaria as well. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, thank you, uh, Shinu, for, for your uh, nice words about me and your lengthy introduction. Um, I, well, uh, employment is an issue which has uh, been uh, with me for a long time. Uh, very recently, we at IHD wrote a report along with ILO uh, on employment. It's called the India Employment Report 2024. It's available on the website. It's available on the website. Uh, that report came out just on the eve of the present elections and created quite a furore in the media. Uh, my lecture today actually draws uh, mainly uh, from the work done for this report. It also draws on work done by others using the other, some other data sources, particularly the CMIE. Uh, let me briefly explain why I have chosen this theme for the lecture today. Uh, and maybe maybe at this stage I can see whether the presentation can be put on. Just a second. As uh, you know, <clears throat> Professor uh, Father Korean pointed out, uh, employment has been a burning problem with us. Recently, just before the elections, there was a survey which was carried out by the CSDS in Delhi. Uh, it was a nationwide survey. And the survey pointed out that uh, the number one problem, number one challenge that was seen by the people of India uh, in that elections, in the in the election, in the Lok Sabha election, which has now concluded, was employment. Yet, as we go through the manifesto of the political parties, we find that they there is a very different. They have very different perspectives on employment. While some political parties regarded employment as a very major challenge and had addressed this in the manifesto. Uh, there were other major political parties which dealt with employment and in the business as usual scenario uh, and did not quite recognize the challenge that this, this constituted. What is the reason for this? The reason is not only, of course, I mean, the, the reason lies uh, not only because they have different perceptions of the economy, but it also lies in the fact that the hard data that we have gives us conflicting views of employment. Uh, so one of the reasons that I thought I'd take up this topic is to look at the hard data. What is the data that we have, the official data, as well as the unofficial data that we have? What is the story about employment that emerges? Why is it that different people, different political parties have different perspectives about employment? Uh, more than that, I want to actually uh, use this opportunity to unfold the complexity of the notion of employment. Very often, when we talk about employment or unemployment, we are basically, uh, you know, thinking of one particular indicator uh, or uh, are we thinking of a simple black and white way of looking at employment. And I want to use this, uh, this opportunity in this lecture to disabuse that. The employment, employment is a complex issue in a country like India. The employment challenge is multidimensional and complex. So that's basically the reason why uh, I, I thought I would uh, use this lecture as a kind of a foothold, as an entry point to explain some of these issues uh, to the students in the audience. I hope I don't become too obtuse. So basically, uh, the first point I want to make it that in a country like India, India is a very complex country, a developing country, where the notion of employment and unemployment itself is very complex. For those of you who have done some economic policy and the economy, you would realize that uh, the Lagdawala Committee in India recommended actually not one, but four ways of measuring employment. So, you, however, you so a simple indicator of unemployment, however you measure it, cannot encapsulate the entire employment challenge. What I will be striving to do in this lecture is to describe this challenge as being multidimensional. And I'm going to deal with four major aspects of this multidimensional challenge. Number one, the underemployment and the quality of employment challenge. Two, the how it, the, the the way employment is growing in the country uh, challenges our notion of structural change and development. Three, the quiet crisis of women's employment, 
and of those women who are neither in employment, education or training, which is known as NEAT. And finally, the well-known problem of the or the explosive challenge of educated youth employment. So I'm going to broadly deal with these many dimensions of employment. Now, when we talk about employment, uh, we have uh, many sources of data. We have a large number of small surveys, micro surveys and so on. But essentially, um, the, when academics like us uh, talk about employment, we have two macro sources of data uh, in India. One is the official source. And this survey, this, this source is the employment and unemployment surveys, which are conducted by the National Service, uh, Survey Office, the NSO. Uh, earlier, they used to be called uh, employment unemployment surveys. Now they are called as the periodic labor force surveys. So this, these are the official sources of data. And then we have the unofficial source of data, which is a very large scale survey, which is conducted by the Center for Monitoring Indian Economy. Uh, the, uh, these are very high frequency. The, the CMI generates very high frequency data on employment and unemployment. And in fact, the survey base uh, for CMI is larger than the PLFS. While PL, PLFS surveys about 1 lakh households, uh, the CMI surveys about 1 lakh 76 thousand households every year. And uh, it's, it, it does it in a manner that it is able to give us daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly and annual estimates of employment and unemployment. Now, one of the sources of confusion is that these two basic data sets, the PLFS, now, now the, the periodic labor force survey and the CMI surveys, they follow very different methodologies. And they follow very different concepts, which actually, you know, which make it very difficult to compare uh, the, the, their results. So their results become quite different when you look at them. Now, underlying all of this, there is a kind of a, uh, uh, consistency. There is a kind of consistency, and I'll mention what the consistency is. So, although they are non-comparable in many ways, you cannot compare their results, and I'll be showing how their results are different uh, in in very critical uh, uh, indicators. But at the same time, uh, there is an underlying consistency, uh, and that underlying consistency comes from the fact that they use different concepts, and when you allow for the different concepts then you can understand this consistency okay so when you take uh, when you give when you give consideration to this underlying consistency then you can see that there are broad similarities in the underlying trends which are reflective of a labor market crisis and so we, both of them both the cmi and plfs although they say different things both reflect a labor market crisis and they also show us that the labor market <coughs> has not recovered fully from the covid the impact of the covid pandemic so both of both these data sources do tell us the same uh, kind of a similar story when you get to the bottom of it uh, now one of the big problems in uh, looking at data to describe the employment challenges that we do have you know the, in the in the last 10 years there have been some major shocks to the economy uh, most of most of you most of most of you would know what these shocks are there was the shock of demonetization then the way the, the gst was implemented then the lag lockdowns etc and all of them had had a very major impact on the labor markets uh, some of you might remember demonetization demonetization now happened uh, it, it happened in 2016 so eight years ago and you would remember that even during demonetization there was the uh, the unemployment it was so high particularly in urban areas and in the industrial economy was so high that the large number of people who were working in the urban economy actually returned to the rural areas so although in the lockdown we saw this visible uh, ex urban exodus of millions and millions of people returning to the uh, areas of origin we also saw that during demonetization so demonetization, GST had an impact on the informal economy, had an impact on small businesses and had an impact on the labor market. And, uh, and these were captured by documented, captured by journalists, captured in, in smaller surveys uh, and so on, written about at the great deal. But at the macro level, 
we don't have the data to st study the impact particularly of demonetization and of the of of gst um, the lockdown is a little better captured although not so so well um, the other problem is that we don't have uh, uh, an employment survey which was ca carried out between 2011-12 and 17-18 uh, there were uh, surveys which were carried out by the labor bureau but there were major problems with them the cmi also survey uh, the cmi survey methodology also underwent a change in 2017-18 so basically we don't really have a way of capturing the impact of the policy shocks which happened in 2016-17 and 2017-18 and then when it comes to covid although both plfs and CMI do capture the impact of the COVID pandemic, but there were major problems in the way they captured this impact. So uh, we have to take their results for the COVID period with a pinch of salt. <clears throat> now I'm going to, uh, so as I said, I'll deal with the different aspects of the labor market and I'll try to introduce to you this whole notion of why is it complex? Why do different actors, different political actors, for example, have different ways of looking at the labor market crisis, different ways of, of interpreting the employment challenge. Uh, and what underlies, however, what underlies all of this. So uh, when economists talk about the labor market, actually the first thing which comes to their mind is that they talk about some leading labor market indicators. Now these leading labor market indicators are uh, labor force participation rate, worker population ratio or the employment ratio, and the unemployment rate. Uh, these are the three major uh, indicators in the terms of which we speak about. The, these are the leading labor market indicators. Uh, just to give you a sense, although I think as students of economics, most of you would know what these are, the labor force participation rates tells us uh, if we take the 15 plus population, let's leave out the younger people, very young children and so on. Uh, then the proportion of people who are participating, willing to participate in employment, all those who are willing or actually participating in employment, the, their proportion constitute the labor force participation rate. And the proportion of people actually participating in the labor market, in other words, all, uh, actually in employment, constitutes the worker population ratio or the employment ratio. Uh, so that, and what is unemployment? Out of the people who are willing to participate in the labor market, there is a set of people who are not able to find a job. So the proportion of people who are not able to find a job as a ratio of the people who are willing to participate in the labor market gives us the unemployment ratio. So the, the, these are the three labor market indicators that they're indeed very important. But uh, they can also give us a misleading uh, sense of where the labor market is moving. Now, if you look at, for example, if you look at how labor market tends to have moved in the la in, in, in since 2017-18, uh, these are these the figures that I have drawn here are drawn from the periodic labor force survey. All of them, what they show is that after 17-18, the top line, the top red line. Is a periodic labor force the 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 the, the uh, labor force participation rate, and you can see that it it uh, falls from 61.6 to 49.8 in 2017-18, and then recovers to 57.9. Similarly, the worker participation ratio also recovers after 17-18, and uh, correspondingly, in the reverse flip side, the unemployment rate rises to about 6% in 2017 18 and then it improves slowly to 3.2% in 2023 so so if you look at these figures these figures somehow say give us a very complacent sense of the economy what they say is that look the covid happened covid if you remember happened around 2020 so the covid happened but the COVID didn't really impact on the labor market indicators. Labor market indicators started improving before COVID and continued to improve right through COVID up to 2023, up to the current period. 
Okay, so if that is the case, if labor market indicators, if the labor force participation rate is improving, if uh, workforce per worker per population ratios are improving, if unemployment rates are improving, then what is the problem? And this is something which gets reflected in the manifestos and in the perspectives of some of the major political parties. Uh, what underlies these? This is something we'll explore a little bit in detail. But uh, the, the basic point that is to, to sort of to anticipate what I'm going to say is that although there is a recovery in the labor market indicators on the whole, uh, this is because uh, people, there was a lot of distress employment which was created. And one running theme in my lecture, in the later parts of my lecture also is going to be that the reason why unemployment rates are not so, you know, not the sole indicator and not even the most important indicator when we look at a country like India is simply because the poor people cannot afford to remain unemployment, un unemployed. Uh, this is a major reality about India. So the poor people work and when things get really worse, they, they, when things get really bad, they try to eke out a living by finding some, some kind of job, whether remunerative or unremunerative or very low levels of remuneration. And that is getting reflected in the data that I have shown you here. I, I'll talk a little bit about this later on. Okay, uh, the same thing, this is the same thing, but a little more, uh, uh, it, what the, the, clearly this brings out what I'm trying to say later on. Uh, this In this, I have broken up the rural and the urban um, labor force participation rates. And what you find here is that the dotted line represents the rural labor force participation rates. What you see is that in the early, earlier years, the, the urban labor force participation rate is roughly stable. It has not moved, changed very much over 20, 25 years. It has not changed very much from 2000 to 2023. But the rural labor force participation rates had got worse. Uh, they had declined from 66% to about 50% between 2000 and 2017 18. And then they improved to 60.8%. So basically, it is the rural labor force participation rate which accounts for the overall changes in the participation rate in India. This is the story as far as the PLFS go, and we will go underneath this story and see what it's really about. But strangely, now this is the CMI data. If you look at the CMI data, what the CMI data show us that uh, if the, the top two lines, the blue lines and the red lines, are the labor force participation rate and the worker participation rate to ratio or the employment rates. And the bottom line is the unemployment rate. So you can focus, for example, if you focus on the uh, employment rate, uh, which is the red line, what you find is that if you look, if you compare December 19, the December 19 uh, data, the point, and then you compare it to subsequent points, what you find is that even up to March 24, which is the end point of this graph, uh, the, the, the employment rate, ratio had not recovered in the Indian economy. The employment ratio in the Indian economy was still below the level of December 19. So what does the CMI data shows? CMI data shows an impact of COVID, the COVID pandemic. And it shows that even for four years after the COVID pandemic, uh, the employment rate, the employment ratio had not recovered in the Indian economy. Similarly, if you look at the bottom line, which is the unemployment rate, the unemployment rate, of course, peaked in, in uh, March to June 20, and then it again uh, increased between March and June 21. Uh, but if you look at the overall unemployment rate, what you find is that the unemployment rate consistently right up to March 24 remains at a level which is higher than December 19, the pre-COVID level. Uh, so, if you, the CMI data actually gives you a different picture, the picture that it gives you is that the economy, the labor market indicators had not recovered even four years after COVID, the labor market indicators had not recovered to the pre-COVID levels. 
why is it that the CMI shows one kind of figure and the PLFS shows another kind of figure? The major reason, and this is something which I we can talk about a little later, to discuss it also is that uh, CMI, uh, I, I have not put the figures on the same graph, but you will notice that the labor participation rates of the in the CMI are consistently also lower than those in the PLFS. Uh, the reason mainly is that the CMI does not capture unpaid work, does not capture what is known as unpaid work. And this unpaid work is the work mainly that women do in the economy, women do in, in agricultural establishments, where women do in non-agricultural establishments. So CMI does not capture this kind of work. Because it does not keep, capture this kind of work, it gives you a different profile of employment and unemployment. This is one main reason, I'm not the only reason, but one main reason why the CMI gives you a picture which is different from the PLFS. PLFS includes unpaid work, it improves low quality self-employment, and because it includes all that, it gives you a higher period, uh, higher labor force participation rates, and it also gives you a different trend of the economy in recent years, because it is precisely these kinds of employment, the low quality employment, the self-employment, the unpaid employment, which has been increasing. And this is something I'll turn to a little later. So if you look at CMI, what the CMI tells you is that the overall labor force participation rate declined from 42.7% in 2980 to 40%, remained stable at that level, and then improved a little bit in 23-24, but still below pro-COVID levels. Similarly, correspondingly, there were changes in the employment rate. The unemployment rate shot up on 7.6% in 1920 to 9.8% in 2021, moderated a little bit, but in 23-24, it was still 8.2% above the level in 1920. So there are these two different pictures uh, that the PLFS gives you and the CMI gives you. I would like you to keep these in mind and we'll unbundle the PLFS figures for you a little more. Okay. Now, in unbundling these figures uh, for you, I'll also go into a, a, a major dimension of the employment challenge in India, which is a quiet crisis of women's employment. Uh, now, this is, again, uh, if you look at the PLFS here, I'm, I'm looking at the PLFS here. The PLFS, the bottom figure in the PLFS, the, the top dotted line gives you the labor force participation rate of men in the economy. And this is consistently close to 80%. As you can see, uh, the trend, this there is a little bit of fluctuation, but not much. The bottom line is the female labor force participation rate. In 2000, at the beginning, it was the highest at 38.9%. Then it came down very sharply to 23.3% in 2017-18. And then, it, according to the periodic labor force survey, it has increased to 37% in 2023. 20, uh, it is still below the 2000 level, but it has increased. Now, the first point to note is that the participation rate, the female labor force participation rate in India is among the lowest in the world. Uh, even if you take the high points, even if you take 38.9%, which was a labor force participation rate in 2000, it is among the lowest in the world. Uh, and of course, it is very, very low compared to the male counterparts. You can see that the gender inequalities in female labor force participation rate is very high. Now, uh, uh, some people argue, and again, uh, I would refer also to what some uh, you know advocates of some political parties have argued is that female labor force participation rates have been improving therefore the overall condition of employment among women has been improving and this is a notion which i will seek to disabuse by telling you that the, that although the employment rate and the labor force participation rate for women has improved actually it is very poor quality employment it is basically distress employment so this is the uh, this is the detailed activity status of all workers by gender, by male and female. Uh, when I say activity status, what do I mean? I break this up into the different kinds of jobs, the different kinds of jobs that men and women do. So we have the total self-employed workers, total self-employed, and this breaks up into three categories. There are the own account workers, the employers, 
and the unpaid family workers. And then there are regular employees, casual workers. So three major types of employment, self-employed, regular employment, and casual work. And the self-employed are broken up further into own account workers, employers, and unpaid family workers. Now, if you look at the first and the second column, and if you look at the self-employed, the self-employed were 51.6% among men and 53.3% among women. Uh, men, majorly, they were own account workers. So they were working uh, working in small enterprises on their own account without, without uh, hired workers and so on. But if you look at women, then the most major category for women happens to be unpaid family workers. So women are basically contributing workers. They're working in, in, in on farm or in small enterprises, assisting the men on the farm, but not getting any remuneration uh, for, for the work that they do. And I would now like you to compare the two columns which I have highlighted in blue, the 2019 column and the 2022 column. The one is the pre-COVID year, the other is the post-COVID year. And you see that self-employment for women jumps up from 53% to 62% by 9% points. It jumps up quite a lot. And if you look at the, the category-wise increase within self-employment, you see that the maximum increases of unpaid family workers among women, their percent increased from 30.8 to 36.5%. So that this increased by almost 6% point. So you can see that a lot of women were joining the labor force, joining the workforce, but they were joining us as unpaid family workers. So they were just, you know, they were trying to do something which would contribute to the household production without really this being remunerative work. And this was really, this can really be construed as a sign of distress. So the swelling up of labor force participation that you see in women's work in recent years mainly appears to be a sign of distress and not a sign of, of, uh, of any, anything positive happening in the Indian economy by and large. Uh, and most of these changes have taken place in the rural areas because what has happened is that there's a crowding of workers in rural areas uh, from about 1718 as employment opportunities declined in urban areas the the workers the labor market got a little bit crowded in rural areas and particularly as i said women started doing all kinds of low remunerative and unremunerative work and this you can see from this figure and once again you see that the major increase is in the unpaid family work of women uh, earlier 37.8% Women were working as unpaid family workers, but in 2022, of a higher number of women, 42.6% were working as unpaid family workers. So women were crowding into the rural uh, labor markets, were crowding into agricultural labor markets, mainly working as unpaid workers. Uh, and this is this is some this is a phenomena which started before COVID, but became much worse during the COVID period. Now, one characteristic of women is that uh, men, if you look at young men particularly, what most young men are either studying or they find some kind of employment. There is a very small percentage of them who are not studying, not undergoing training, and who are also not in employment. But when it comes to women, the percentage of women who are neither in employment, education, nor training is very high. And this figure gives you the figures for different years from 2000 to 2022. And what you see is that nearly half of young women, half of young women are not studying. They're not in employment or training. So they basically doing domestic chores and sitting at home, contributing to family work, but not doing any kind of remunerative work, and they're not even studying. Their proportions are extra. In, in India, the proportion of young women in need is extraordinarily high. And one can argue that this is really, although it is not that these women are not working, they are doing domestic chores, but and from the point of view of gainful employment, one can say, 
that a large amount of the potential which is available to the Indian economy is not being utilized. The potential that is in the form of young women who could do be doing the same kind of things that young men are doing. So essentially, as far as the a major problem is that of women's employment, that very few women are in employed employment, uh, that in recent years, although there is an upturn in women's employment, this is mostly very low quality employment, unpaid work, a major, major, major issue as far as women is concerned, that the very large proportion of them are not in education, not in employment, not in training. They are, they are basically working, contributing to the domestic economy, doing domestic chores, but are outside the gainful employment scenario. Um, and th this is a figure from the CMI, which shows you that although there are very few women in the labor force, even then the per percentage of women who are unemployed, the unemployment rate among women is much higher than among men. The unemployment rate among women is measured by the red line, while that among males is, is measured by the blue line. And uh, again, this is the employment ratio. And you can see that the employment ratio among women is much lower than that among men. So just to sum up this section, female labor force participation rates are extremely low by international standards in India. And need rates among women are correspondingly very high. Uh, the periodic labor force survey estimates show a reversal of the long-term declining trend in FLPR after 2017-18. However, this is mainly due to rising self-employment in the form of unpaid work in rural areas, which appears to be distress-driven. Uh, CMI estimates show higher unemployment rates among women than men and do not co corroborate the rising trend in female participation rates in recent years. Okay, so this is one kind of crisis that I wanted to talk about. The second kind of crisis is that, as I said, that uh, it that it that Poor people in India cannot remain to be unemployed. So they work. But they are not able to consistently remain in employment. They do not consistently or they do not consistently get employment. So what this results is, is in underemployment. So the figures for unemployment underemployment are roughly three times the figure for unemployment. And the quality of employment that we have in India is of very low levels. And this is the, the, the problem of in India, the major problem is not only unemployment, and this is something which deserves to be emphasized, but that the, of the working poor, that people work, but despite that, because of the poor conditions of work, they are uh, they are impoverished. Their conditions of work are very poor. So I begin just broadly with some estimates of uh, underemployment and labor utilization, and you can see that almost 10% of workers are underemployed. And these figures are much higher than the figures for unemployment in the Indian economy. Now, uh, these are some figures which tell you the employment quality. First of all, I think all of us know that uh, uh, the info what is known as informal employment. In other words, people who are working informally they don't have job security they don't have social security their percentage in india is very high uh, this the top table gives you the percentage for different years and this percentage is more than 90 percent and this percentage not only encapsulates those who work in tiny establishments as informal workers but actually if you look at the large establishments the formal sector establishment there is a very high percentage of informal workers even among the larger establishment. These are people working as casual on casual employment, people working on, on, on contractual employment, and so on and so forth. Okay. So the, 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 this this is this is this really gives you encapsulates poor quality jobs. Informality encapsulates poor quality jobs. The other thing you notice from the bottom table is that uh, that in the recent years, in the COVID and post-COVID years, the percentage of regular formal jobs has been declining. So people who are getting paid by the month or by the week, their proportion 
as a proportion of total workers has been declining. Uh, as I have already pointed out, the proportion of unpaid family workers has been increasing. And that is what the bottom line tells you. And this is something about uh, uh, wage conditions. Basically, what we find is that in the recent period, uh, uh, real wages and earnings are either stagnant or, do or, de or are declining. And what is very significant is that a large proportion of regular workers, 40.8% and casual and 51.9% of casual workers in our estimate, did not receive the average daily minimum wage prescribed for unskilled workers. So almost half the workforce did not get the prescribed minimum wage. Okay. So, uh, and of course, the productivity also in some of the sectors in agriculture, construction, etc. is very low because they've experienced low growth. So, uh, the working conditions in general are very poor with a large percentage of the workers being deprived of minimum wages and con in working in conditions of informality. And so, focus really needs to be in terms of improving the quality of work for the majority of the workforce in India. Okay, uh, now this is a this is an aspect of change which we sometimes uh, don't talk about uh, because it's not so well understood. Uh, what has happened in recent years is, you know, students here, uh, students of development economics know very well that as development happens, the share of agriculture declines and the share of industry and services increases. Now, one of the reasons why this is good for development, good for growth is because the productivity in agriculture is low. So workers move out of low productivity sectors into higher productivity sectors. And this therefore, this therefore becomes a driver of growth, the movement from low productivity sectors to high productivity sectors. Now, what has happened in India? I've already talked about the fact that since the last few years, Workers have been crowding into the rural areas and urban areas. And what has happened in, 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 in recent years is that if you, if you look at this graph, this makes it clearer. Uh, the top line is the share of agriculture in gross value added, sorry, in total employment. And you see that uh, the share of agriculture in total employment was steadily declining up to 2017, 18 and 18, 19. But thereafter, it has increased. Between 2019 to 2021, it increased quite dramatically by 4 percent points. So what, have, what you have is a kind of a structural retrogression. The, the Basically, instead of the low productivity sector throwing out workers and workers moving to higher productivity sectors, in the last few years, a reverse change is happening. Workers are crowding into the low productivity sector, which is agriculture. And this is something which is, of course, inimical to growth and development. And this is something which is confirmed not only by uh, the PLFS data, not only by the periodic labor force data, but actually it also is confirmed by the CMI data. CMI also data shows that there has been a rising growth in agriculture uh, right up to uh, from, from the pre-COVID period up to 23-24 and that it shows that there is an occupation transition from the non-farm to farm sector within the formal sector and this started during pre-COVID and continued during the COVID lockdown and post-COVID periods. So you have this reverse change taking place and this reverse change is confirmed both by the periodic labor force survey and by the CMI data. Okay, so both uh, PLFS and CMI show that there has been a structural retrogression in the employment structure with an increase in the share of agriculture. The slow transition from agriculture to non-agriculture has been thwarted at least temporarily with development implications. Now I'll get to the, uh, the problem which most of us recognize the most, which is the problem of educated youth and employment. And to just to anticipate uh, my argument, uh, the when we talk about unemployment and when, when we talk about the, the youth unemployed form a very, and the educated youth unemployed form a very large part of open unemployment in, in, in India. And 
they are forming an ever increasing part and i'm going to talk a little bit about why this is happening and what is the nature of this problem so so if you look at this this gives you the broad activity level of youth from uh, 2000 to 2022 to uh, this thing the gray bars uh, in between in the middle are the percentage of st of youth who are students okay and what you see is that the percentage of youth who are students their percentage increased from 18.5 percent in 2000 to 34.7 per per percent in 2022 so it almost doubled okay so a greater number of student uh, youth are 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 in the process of gaining education or becoming educated okay so in terms of activity status this forms the largest chunk and then of course there are those who are employed and so on but i want to point out this significant fact that that uh, as an activity component the share of students who are getting educated has been steadily increasing and this gives you the educational profile of youth by educational attainment level uh, here again i would like you to note the top two bars the blue bar and the and the yellow bar below it the blue bar is, are, are the graduate and above students the, the youth who have graduate and above degrees and the yellow bar are the, are the youth who have secondary or higher secondary certificates and you can see that both these bars have been increasing quite steadily quite quite a lot so the proportion of of youth who are currently secondary or above educated or graduate and above educated is increasing in the indian economy consistently increasing in the so youth are getting more and more educated and this is i will show how this has implications for employment now this this shows you that as the youth you no know, this gives you the activity level of youth by levels of education uh, if you look at below primary the least educated youth they are either self employed or they are casual workers but then if you look at the other end the youth who have graduate and above degrees what you find is that a majority of them nearly 60% are regular employment in regular employment so basically the quality of employment among young people improves with the level of education okay so that is okay uh, this is a little more detail but what it tells you is that actually the more educated the youth the more likely they are likely to be in the formal sector the more likely they are to, uh, to be in, in, in the services sector, in, in manufacturing and particularly in the service sector, whereas the less educated youth are likely to be in the primary sector and in manufacturing and construction. So again, once again, you find that education helps youth get better jobs. Now, what, the, what happened during COVID? Now, this is a graph only for the urban areas from the periodic labor force survey and the red graph shows you the unemployment rate and you can see that the unemployment rate peaked during the first COVID phase uh, and then it has it has gradually come down it has gradually come down according to the periodic labor force survey but again this coming down is once again due to the fact that i have already mentioned earlier part of it is because the youth too, like the rest of the uh, people, get getting crowded into poor quality jobs. Now, this gives you the unemployment rate among youth by levels of education. Uh, so, the, the, the bar, at the, the line at the top, the yellow line at the top gives you the unemployment rate among youth who are graduate and above. And you can see how high this is. This used to be 24%, 29%, 19%, 20%. And this rose to 35.4% in 2017-18. Uh, in, in, uh, 20, 20, and then tapered down a little bit. But even in 22-23, this was as high as 28%. And by the way, it is higher among female than among males. 
So it's extraordinarily high. You know, the higher the level of education, the higher is the level of unemployment among you. So on the one hand, if with education, youth can get better jobs. But on the other hand, with education, youth tend to become, the unemployment rate among youth also rise to extraordinary levels. Uh, now, this is the same thing only for two years, uh, for 2022, 2000 year, year, and, two, and 2022, and giving you the, uh, the unemployment rates uh, for, two, for both these years at different levels of education. And you can see that for graduate and above levels, again, uh, in 2000, a quarter of the youth were uh, unemployed. Whereas in, 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 in 2022, nearly 30% of the youth were unemployed. Now, this gives you the unemployment rates across these across 2005 and 2022 for those with different levels of technical education. And here again, you find that even with technical education, the unemployment rates are very high. So, for example, if for technical people with technical degrees also, let's say engineering degrees or medical degrees, uh, nearly 30% of such youth were unemployed in 2022 uh, compared to 18% earlier. So, it's been rising. Uh, I mean, even if you have technical degrees, even if you have technical diplomas, the percentage of youth who are unemployed has been rising and is very high. Uh, now, this tells you, if you look at the, the top uh, dotted line, tells you the what is the percentage of youth among the total unemployed. And the percentage of youth among the total unemployed, uh, in, in recent years, of course, the general unemployment rate, rates have increased, even for the uneducated youth. But even then, you find it in 2022, 83% uh, of uh, the total unemployment was youth unemployment. 83% of the total unemployment was youth unemployment. And the bottom red line is very revealing that out of the total unemployed, in 2000, 54% were had secondary or higher level of education. But in 2022, <coughs> 66%, two thirds of all unemployed people were youth with secondary or higher levels of education. So every unemployed person, or every three unemployed persons, two people were young people with secondary or higher education. That is the extent of educated unemployment. <clears throat> now, there is a belief, uh, which is partly correct. There is a belief that the, that the educated unemployed, among the educated unemployed, uh, the unemployment levels are high. Uh, because the, these people come from better off sections of society. They can afford to remain unemployed. What this table tells you is, what we have done is, we have taken MPC, we have taken the quintile groups. The bottom most quintile group, the, the poorest group is Q1, and the best of group is Q5. And it is giving you the uh, unemployment rates among youth, the, the red line is graduate and above, and the blue line is secondary uh, and higher education. So if you look at the graduate and above line, for example, that even among the poorest group, 29.4% people, young people in the poorest group with, with graduate and above education were unemployed. And among the, in the best of group, 25.8% of these youth were unemployed. So just to emphasize the point, poverty al alone is not determining whether uh, educated youth is unemployed or not. You can be, you know, it's not just that the better of youth are staying unemployed because they can afford to stay unemployed. Even the poorest youth are staying unemployed. And in fact, a higher proportion of the poorest youth are staying unemployed compared to the better of youth. So there is not only a question of uh, it's not only a question of wanting or being able to stay unemployed, but it is a question of not being able to find appropriate jobs, and this is something which I really want to emphasize.
Now, this is very interesting. I am not going to explain this in detail, but actually it gives you uh, the, if the, the top line should tells you the workforce participation rate of youth by levels of education. And when it comes to may, if it comes to females, which is the dotted red line, this is a this is a U-shaped curve. This is a familiar U-shaped curve. Female participation rate rises at the highest level of education, but for males, it is the other way around. The male participation rate actually falls at the highest levels of education because of unemployment. Okay. So this there's a different characteristics between male young males and young females when it comes to taking up employment. <clears throat> Finally, what we did in the India Employment Report is to look at what do educated young people do, and what we found is that there was a high proportion of highly educated young men and women, including the technically educated. Who are working who are overqualified for the jobs that they had for example they had phd degrees but they were working in grade d jobs as peons or as uh, coolies or as laborers so so we find we found that highly educated youth graduate level or higher had taken up blue collar public sector jobs indicating a mismatch or overqualification for jobs we found that 58 percent of graduates uh, and 27.2% of postgraduates were engaged in blue collar jobs in 2022. High degree of overqualification. We even among the technically qualified youth, we found that two fifths of them were engaged in vocations that did not correspond to their qualifications. So basically, the the, the as far as the youth is concerned, uh, not only over time, the level of education is rising above them. Youth aspire for better jobs. And better jobs means higher education. But with higher education also comes higher levels of, of, of unemployment. And not only higher levels of unemployment, the a larger and larger proportion of young people are being forced to do poor quality jobs. So, in if you look at literature, if you look at perception, this is largely seen as a supply side problem. What we, what do people say? People say there's a skill mismatch. Oh, the youth, you know, the youth don't, uh, are not getting jobs because they don't have the right kind of skills. Now, this is only partly true. The India Employment Report 2024 establishes that the genuine problem, the bigger problem is on the demand side, lack of adequate expansion, of suitable and decent jobs at both ends of the skill spectrum. You know, if those who are low skilled want decent jobs, those who are high skilled, highly educated also want decent jobs, but they also preferably want white collar jobs. As education increases, there is a growing aspiration for decent jobs, offering good wages, stable employment, and proper working conditions among the youth. However, these jobs are not growing fast enough in the economy. Then there are also regional issues. In slow growing regions, there is a greater pressure on public sector jobs to meet this requirement because the private sector is not performing. So when it comes to states like UP, Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, and so on, there's a very great pressure on public sector jobs because the private sector economy, the private economy is not growing fast enough. And this is really building up to an explosive situation. So the I, I call the youth employment, I really call as an explosive problem in as far as the economy is concerned. So let me let me summarize these challenges. I have summarized it for you already. Uh, I have not been able to go into strategies. Maybe in the discussion, if there is time, we can talk a little bit about strategies and where where we have gone wrong, where what is the corrective steps that we can take in. But I want to point out once again that the challenge of employment in India is multidimensional. It cannot be measured by a single indicator such as the unemployment rate. It was deeply impacted by the shocks 
of 2016, 17, 20, and 21, but very poorly measured. The impact of the, the shocks on the labor market was deep, but we don't have the proper tools to measure their impact. The quality challenge, the sorry, the quantity challenge is a, a mistake here. The quantity challenge is supplemented by an even more serious quality challenge. So although we have a quantity challenge in the shape of unemployment and underemployment, the bigger challenge is the quality challenge. People are doing very poor quality jobs, uh, not earning enough, jobs are not stable, they are informal, uh, and so on. <clears throat> Both the periodic labor force survey and the Center for Monetary Indian Economy survey indicate a structural retrogression in employment structure and crowding into unpaid work in agriculture. So there has been a reversal in the structural change that was happening. And this reversal, I must underscore, <coughs> was made much worse by the COVID pandemic, but actually it started happening before COVID. Now, this reversal, this, this crowding into low quality, uh, unpaid work in agriculture, mainly accounts for the supposed improvement in labor market indicators across gender, which is shown by the periodic labor force survey. So we should not get too carried away by the labor market indicators, the, by the gross labor market indicators, because when you unpackage them, you see that actually it is because people crowded into very low quality work, enumerative work, that you got the trends that you see in the PLFS labor market indicators. Uh, I've underscored that female employment constitutes uh, the, the major quiet crisis of the unemployment story. Uh, it has to be fully understood and it has to be fully captured in policy. And finally, educated youth and employment across all classes has reached explosive dimensions, both due to demand and supply constraints. This, of course, is the explosive part of the uh, unemployment problem, which I have underscored. Uh, I'll stop here. As I said, I have not been going gone into, I have not been able to go into strategy issues, policy issues because of length of time. Uh, I've taken almost an hour. Uh, I, I, I take it back to the organizers now for any discussion which may be able to happen. Thank you very much. Now it's time for the question and answer session. The audience can raise the doubts or questions about the topic. You can either unmute yourself or write down the question in the chat box. Can I break the silence? Yes, yes, Nathikudin, sir, you can. Uh, I am... <laughs> Matthew Gurian, presently the Joint Director of KN Raj School of Economics of Mahatma Gandhi University. Uh, Professor C. Sitskaria was my great guru and mentor. So I also uh, acknowledge his great contribution to students like me at this point of time. Uh, I also want to congratulate the Department of Economics St. Bergman's College for organizing such a very useful webinar. And uh, Professor Ravi Sastava, uh, I thank you for two reasons. One, the relevance of the topic which you have suggested for discussion, the whole question of unemployment or employment. Uh, this, the second, the way in which you discussed the burning issue in such a nice manner. And you resorted to the main sources of data presently available, PLFS and CMI. I think that is very useful to the students because this is an area where students don't get much consciousness, but it, it enabled them to come to know the significance of data. We are living in the age of data. 
but i think cmi data has a problem with regard to uh, the government so how do, uh, how, uh, how would you see that that is a, an incidental question i wanted to raise however uh, i i don't have any disagreement or any point of debate about uh, the presentation which you have done however for the matter of discussion i like to raise three issues one is the question of migration uh, we know that uh, when the, you, you you referred it to covid 19 we saw the agony of internal migration in our country at that point of time at the same time now we have a new phenomenon of educational migration you referred it to the youth and the whole question of unemployment the for educational purpose the youth is going abroad uh, what, what i have great great diffidence on that sort of a migration however that is a phenomenon which we come across today so this is one of the issues which i wanted the second thing is the whole question of technology you referred it you referred it to the uh, uh, the new technology the uh, you know the jig economy like that uh, uh, so uh, again to me is techno both uh, uh, technology both in terms of embodied capital or in te in, te uh, in terms of artificial intelligence both these are killing jobs you look at the way in which construction is being conducted now the machines are doing the work not human beings so we have so the the we we equate uh, uh, technology with the growth and development and we say that if, if so much percentage of growth is there then that a proportion of people will be get employed i think this is uh, misleading the, uh, the and they want to uh, glorify jobless growth uh, that, that is so the second point i wanted to highlight is about the, the role of technology how will you, how we have, how will we tackle that you refer to the policy issue and the, the, the third point which i wanted to bring to is the whole question of commodification of labor and the deprivation of human uh, labor rights. You referred to the latest uh, uh, report of ILO. ILO is now, I think it is marginalized. It is the first uh, multilateral organization which was started in 1919, but now its functioning is almost because all over the world, capital is emphasizing its rights and not labor. And we, we have we, we have several reports uh, establishing this fact so these are three uh, points which came to my mind but again uh, i appreciate the great uh, presentation you have made uh, i am deeply thankful to you as a student of processes it's career also i i, I am grateful to you uh, with these words, I, let me uh, cut short my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kurian. Thank you for your very insightful comments. Uh, very briefly, migration is influenced by uh, two major factors. One is demography, the other is unequal development. Uh, and this, of course, is both refers to internal migration as well as international migration, the influence of demography and the influence of uh, unequal development uh, is is very profound uh, on migration trends. And we can see this, you know, within the country, the kind of patterns that we are seeing of migration from the south, from the uh, north center and northeast to the west and south of the country. And then, of course, now to uh, other regions of the world. And uh, but migration is not cannot be the central corrective as far as labor market uh, imbalances are concerned. Uh, there has to be an aspect of regional development. Uh, so in other words, we have to focus on making development less unequal. Uh, that so the development there has there's a major orders on development because migration cannot possibly correct for all the the, the entire labor market imbalance. It's a very costly. It's a very human costly process. It's a very costly process. And then when it comes to international migration, there are national barriers also, which need to be crossed. Uh, on this the question of technology, you're absolutely right. Uh, there are systemic changes which are happening. 
the systemic changes are making uh, the entire production process more capital intensive. Uh, in India, there is an additional factor, which is that uh, we uh, have not been, uh, we, we, you know, our, our our growth process is service sector intensive. So we our is mainly, you know, the service sector which is uh, growing very fast, whereas the share of uh, uh, the manufacturing sector has remained more or less the same. It has remained roughly stable over the years. Uh, how exactly do we generate a labor-intensive pattern of growth? Given given the current international context, is a very major issue, and this is something which we need to which we need to concern ourselves with. And your third question again, I completely agree with this. Uh, there has been a, a major tilt in the balance uh, between labor and capital towards capital. Uh, this has uh, occurred post globalization. Uh, globalization has had a major has a great deal to do with it. It has uh, it has initiated a race to the bottom uh, across countries, um, and the price of you know uh, the variable cost which is included in labor is something which most firms seek to minimize. Uh, most of all, uh, they're taking other costs as given. So this has given given rise to a major imbalance between capital and labor. Uh, there are no easy answers to this. There, there is obviously something which has to do with the pattern of international growth. As I said, globalization has to do with it. It has to do with national strategies. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, ever since the days that I was in the NCUS, what we have emphasized is uh, basically building a social floor. And a, a social floor which consists of, of a number of social and economic entitlements. Uh, for the poor in this country, uh, and that we believe will raise the reservation wages also, you know, push the reservation wages up in the country, uh, so that the country doesn't necessarily get forced into a, a, a low root path to to, to 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 development. But these are very complex questions, and thank you for raising all these three sets of questions. <clears throat> uh, would would questions which are coming on chat box would uh, the moderators like to uh, present them to me or how would you like to do it there are some hands which are raised also yeah uh, sir uh, actually uh, if you can see the question uh, questions you can uh, take the questions one by one from the uh, box or i should read it out for you sir um, uh, actually, Vimal Mohan, um, uh, Dr. Vimal Mohan from English Department of uh, St. Berkman's College, uh, he has uh, pointed out a comment here. Uh, this seems to me uh, not from an economics background, like a fate shared by millennials everywhere, being in India, China, or North America. It's also another um, comment. And in fact, a question, young millennials are unable to obtain jobs that match their educational portfolio, suffer under massive student debt, have little job security, and are unable to afford homes and families. Could there be some common underlying universal factors? So at the, the, it's true that at the global level, the youth employment problem, uh, there, is, there are global manifestations of the youth employment problem. But I think the problems are uh, of... Uh, different nature as far as the Indian economy is concerned uh, because here the uh, the ratio of educated youth is rising very fast aspirations of the educated youth are also you know rising very fast and the job market is completely unable to meet these aspirations so what I find is that the the, the 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 problem of youth employment which is really can be reduced to the problem of educated youth and employment uh, is has a very explosive character i don't need to refer you to the many uh, things which have happened uh, in, in, across the country the kind of protest movement that happened after the railway recruitment uh, this thing which took place last year uh, uh, the different kind of recruitment 
protests uh, that have happened you know in different parts of the country they have they're, they're well documented spoken about in the newspapers uh, they are mostly happening in certain regions of the country more than others as i said where public sector jobs are at a much greater premium but my my own sense is that while there is a general uh, uh, global dimension but a dimension that we have in india is is a slightly different it's different you can't really equate it to the dimension in china uh, where jobs are growing at a different pace uh, and uh, the 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 education you know the basically the aspirations of the educated youth are also going at a different phase here uh, the demand for skilled jobs and the supply of skilled jobs there is a very very major disbalance the large percentage of youth are are over qualified for the jobs that they are doing this is also a very major problem so i think there are specific dimensions of the problem in india which may not be the case in china or america or in some other countries but this is something which is worth looking at carefully then uh, yeah then would you like to go to the next question which is, i think nitika yeah nikita has asked a question yeah yeah, yeah this is considering the inter intersectional difference in uh, labor force participation of women it is evident that the participation of muslim women and obc women are low compared to other subgroups other than cultural norms and stigmas can you point out any other possible reason for muslim women's poor labor force participation rate also why do obc women are least represented in the economy is it related to maintaining status or prestige or some other possible reasons so like uh, the the question here is that we would like to consider when we talk about representation in the economy it should be clear to us which segment of the economy that we are talking about because representation of the economy can mean uh, representation as domestic workers as you know as uh, migrant manual workers at a very low end of manufacturing chain and so on and so forth or it can mean in the more visible and better part of the service economy uh, one has to i think because employment is so differentiated that when we talk about women's employment or the employment of any other group and when we want to look at intersectional differences i think it is better to look at that particular segment of the economy and to see which section of the women are better or worse represented now the generic problems are there the generic problems have to do with gender segregation norms and patriarchy Uh, which have which have, the context in which patriarchy and gender segregation operates are very different in different parts of the country it is very different it would be very different in the way it operates in up in bihar in rajasthan <coughs> compared to the way it operates for example in tamil nadu or in telangana so uh, there 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 you, you there are differences there but there are also differences the, the gender segregation norms and segmentation are one aspect of the problem the other aspect of the problem is discrimination so given everything else there is also discrimination which is practiced against different groups of women and this also can be this thing now this is a, in uh, in the context of intersectionality uh, the the issue of discrimination is not so well studied we know that for example uh, uh, there are studies which show aspects of gender discrimination and gender discrimination as you know means that people have similar qualifications if, if, if two people have similar qualifications the labor market discriminates against one person as opposed to another person and this we know happens uh, and this is apart from the other aspects of the economy but some of these questions need to be looked at in much greater greater detail you know what is a what is a dimension of discrimination Uh, with respect to obcs with respect to muslim women with respect to scst women uh, with respect to uh, women in different segments of the market for example uh, you know uh, women women from different ethnic backgrounds working in 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 uh, areas of destination uh, are they also discriminated against in different ways uh, this is a problem which i think is a very um, it's a very researchable problem and we need more information more data on this Okay. Okay. So, Meera Jose has asked a question: How does financial insecurity resulting from unemployment drive individuals to commit crimes? 
Uh, you know, I have no data, not data on whether you know it, it drives people to commit crime or not. Uh, I can't say much about that. The financial insecurity is is very much there, and one can see this in in uh, the attitude that young people have in protest movements. Uh, that uh, you know that, and uh, the fact that you know they they can, because of financial insecurity, young people tend to get channelized in different directions. Um, they can be cannon fodder for political parties. They can they can do various things. Uh, I frankly don't have enough data to be able to show uh, whether financial security, the extent to which it drives a particular group towards crime. Uh, yeah. Leah Martin has asked a question. Under the unemployed category in India, about 28% are graduates and above. In this scenario, how do the features of the new education policy, like four-year undergraduate programs, deal with the demand of the job market? Yeah, so the new education policy uh, has brought in the four-year thing, and uh, it has also tried to, trying to introduce a greater degree of relevance and skill orientation in, in the courses. But these are really supply side interventions, uh, unless these are backed by demand side interventions. In other words, unless we see jobs growing for young people uh, who are graduates, I don't think they can solve the problem by themselves. And even, even on the supply side, it is not very clear to me uh, what kind of difference with a four-year degree course make. Uh, you know, I, have a, I have some queries or let's say some doubts about the, the structure which has been proposed in, in higher education for NEP. Uh, we seem to be following a structure which is very different from the uh, structure which is followed in, 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 uh, internationally. Uh, with a, Particularly, I find that uh, uh, research has been, in a sense, under research and specialization, both have been undervalued. Uh, so that is something which worries me. I think there are two people with their hands, Adityan and Navneet. Yeah, we should let them ask. Adityan? Hello, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, uh, sir, uh, we have already mentioned of youths rushing into public sector jobs. And even we can see that many skilled youths are just doing a white collar job, which is not their area of specialization. And as per studies, one and a major reason behind this attraction to government jobs are the job securities provided. Yeah. So, uh, uh, I think, can... yeah, sure. Any other question? No question? Yes, sir. Uh, but this became an issue when unemployment rise, uh, rate rises. And uh, sir, my actual question is, how can we tackle this issue? Because Job security stands as a great magnet which attracts everyone to public public jobs. Yeah, this is absolutely true. What has happened is that in the private sector, uh, jobs are becoming more insecure. Uh, informal jobs are rising in, 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 in the private sector. Whereas the government sector still holds the promise of a stable job and good working conditions. Uh, so there is a great attraction for uh, public sector jobs uh, and this is particularly true in regions where the private sector is not doing very well private sector growth is low so it's particularly true for country states like you know the slow growing states in india you find protests uh, over public sector jobs less in uh, dynamic states like Maharashtra or wherever, you, they are there also in the and they they emerge in the form of reservation demands and other things, but still uh, they are slightly less uh, visible than in states like UP or Bihar or MP and, and states like that. So it's basically because of the promise of stability, promise of good working conditions in the public sector jobs, which are generally seen to be absent from private sector jobs. So the only way this can situation can be corrected uh, is to improve the quality of jobs in the private sector. And uh, uh, the private sector really has to be incentivized to provide formal jobs. Uh, 
uh, which meet 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 the aspirations of young people because you know young people who do a graduate degree or a diploma don't expect to be telemarketers earning a very few very small amounts of salary or worse uh, being doing blue collar jobs in the economy which is what ends up happening navneet would you like to come uh, yes sir good evening uh, am i audible yes sir uh, recently i have read an article and it mentions that the iits are facing a decline of around 30% right. in job offers uh, sir even if the best students of the premier institutes of this country are not getting jobs uh, is it a sign for the youth to leave this country looking for better opportunities or and what is your opinion on this uh yes navneet of course this has been widely reported the iits this this year the job offers that came to the iits were not requisite uh, as i have been pointing out uh, of course this year the it company themselves have not uh, uh, you know taken up too many jobs uh, which is the reason for the situation that we are seeing uh, but essentially it's not a question of people leaving this country and going somewhere else because that's not really uh, that can at best partially address the problem the the main thing is that we need to have an economic strategy in which jobs are generated and this is a question that we need to ask our governments what is your strategy what are you what are you how are you going to ensure that jobs are generated for students who are passing out of the system what kind of jobs are being generated what kind of a strategy what kind of a policy do you have in mind uh, so this is a question which we as researchers we as uh, teachers students have to ask of governments uh, because there are just not enough jobs of the right kind which is absolutely true uh, which is going around but i don't think the solution to, i mean solution of migrating to other countries a lot of people do migrate to other countries Uh, but that solution can only be a partly a partial solution because every country is forced with uh, is faced with um, unemployment issues and the and the job market in 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 other countries also is very very competitive alan would you like to answer ask uh, uh good evening sir yeah sir uh, first of all uh, thank you for in, uh, insightful lecture so i may i want to ask a question like so with the new government is uh, taking oath uh, oath recently so what are your uh, assumptions about what the government can do to increase the demands uh, demand side of the educated unemployment yeah um, and the first thing is uh, the new government has assumed but if you remember at the beginning of the lecture i said the different political parties have different understanding of the problem of unemployment uh, unfortunately the main party which is at the helm of affairs is the center just now if you read their manifesto uh, it, uh, they did not really appreciate the significance of the employment challenge uh, if you read a, a close reading of the their manifesto and uh, mm, in fact there, there was a great deal of there is a great deal of complacency about how the employment situation is being handled uh, i think i think that is the, in my lecture was actually aimed at that kind of complacency uh, to point out that actually the challenge is very very major so the first thing that governments have to do is to recognize the centrality of the employment issue and to put in place policies and strategies which can begin to address the issue so unless they recognize the centrality they will not think about strategies they will not think about the policies that have to put into place so we'll still have to see whether the government now that it has assumed its role as a new government whether it revises its understanding and therefore comes up with a fresh strategy in order to do that nikhil would you like to you have a hand up good evening sir i also had uh, two questions yeah go ahead uh, sir uh, according to you are there any more uh, like dimensions or factors 
still left to be explored through economic analysis like do we have to dig more deeper you know to get the big picture and uh, one, another question was um, well, how do you feel about integrating all kinds of disciplines like uh, an integrated study an all round study of all kinds of disciplines like we can still discuss the politically charged environment or politically charged situations and social aspects or the psychological aspects like uh, like the question we recently discussed about committing crimes how the people commit crimes due to financial insecurity like do you see a scope in, in an integrated approach you not know, to bring an all round solution that benefits our society the answer is yes uh, there, there has to be a multifaceted understanding of the problem of unemployment and the problem of the unemployed what is the kind of challenge which they face what is the kind of uh, 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 you know what is their attitude towards unemployment how do they cope with unemployment uh, young people who have been don't have a job for several years or are forced into taking up jobs which are very much below their expectations uh, what what is the so the, these these issues definitely require a, a, a multidisciplinary a multifaceted understanding of the whole issue so that there is no doubt about it and we have, we, we have very few uh, sociologists psychologists and people from other disciplines in this country addressing this issue uh, i think we had need to have more of them so we have some questions in the chat box may i read out one by one Yes, please. So Thomas has asked, "Is there any way of standardizing the low quality jobs?" Uh, the answer is yes. What we have tried to be uh, advocate since a long time. In fact, uh, when I was a member of the National Commission for Enterprises in the unorganized sector, the NCUS, we tried to uh, we tried to emphasize the notion of a, a social floor. a social floor which meant that you know what are the minimum working conditions uh, minimum wages uh, and other kind of prerequisites which workers should have in the job market uh, and the whole idea was to set a floor for decent work in the economy uh, and i think that is something which we still need to consider and is possible to look at it in that direction so the answer is yes okay. so the next question is nidin has asked with india's demographic dividend peaking what long term strategies should be implemented to ensure that this potential translates into economic growth and not a demographic disaster so uh, nidin is right our demographic potent dividend is peaking uh, we have a very short window now uh, maybe another 10 years 15 years and this window is also mainly with respect not with states like kerala or states in the south but states states in the north which still are in a state of demographic transition uh, they contribute to this window uh, and that we the the whole emphasis our you know as long as young people remain unemployed as long as young people meaning both young and men and women remain unemployed this potential is unexploited so uh, the strategy to provide people with productive jobs is a strategy which can help us exploit the demographic dividend if we do not put this uh, such a strategy in place then uh, there is every possibility that the demographic dividend would turn into a demographic disaster the next question from ashudh alsa babu can we view ai as an as a significant challenge to lack of job opportunities today if so how can today's youth effectively overcome this challenge so there is a generic challenge as i as i said in response to dr kurian uh, there is a generic challenge the challenge is one of technology uh, capital deepening is a challenge uh, with uh, the with capital deepening capital intensity increasing different sectors like construction uh even service sectors like retail etc are becoming more capital intensive and as they become capital intensive their potential for creating jobs decline uh, ai is going to do the same at a particular at particular skill levels it is going to replace uh, jobs which are skilled uh, but not at a very high level of skills at a medium level of skills 
it is going to gradually replace it is beginning to replace such jobs it will replace such jobs so it adds to the technological challenge now when we when when i say that we need a strategy employment strategy that employment strategy has to take into account the fact that uh, these significant challenges exist uh, the the capital deepening is happening uh, there are challenges like ai and we have to think of what is it what what can we do at present in order to have a more labor intensive model of growth uh, are there areas in manufacturing that we can exploit can we still exploit uh, trade uh, you know trade opportunities because actually manufacturing uh, it can still be labor intensive so um, uh, what are, what are, what are the exact areas how exactly do we go about doing it these are the precisely what comes within the realm of looking at an employment strategy and uh, this is what we can do ai is uh, part of the whole gamut of technological changes uh, that are happening and that are deepening the challenge of employment today so the next question from nidin is it valid to ask what lessons india can learn from other countries in addressing unemployment given its significantly larger population size so i i i this is a very valid question uh, how did countries like china uh, because this comparable question china or other countries in east asia uh, handle this question so they handle this question by inserting themselves in global value chains and by by expanding manufacturing uh, at an early stage of development uh, the expansion of manufacturing took place in more or less labor intensive ways so they were able to increase employment uh, a great deal uh, unfortunately we were not able to increase manufacturing to that extent we we, we remained a more service oriented economy and the question is now is if given, given that we have a very late start what is the potential what are the areas in which we have a potential where we can create jobs is manufacturing still one area one of the big one one of the big uh, questions that policy makers face today is that what how much emphasis do they give to manufacturing versus services and in manufacturing how much emphasis do they give to those areas where jobs are likely to expand fast enough so this is in a sense this is a central uh, policy question that we have just now and this is some this is certainly part of the lesson that we learn from uh, other countries like china winda has asked in spite of unemployment due to economic shocks or other factors does there exist a situation where youth has more preference to white collar jobs the answer is yes the youth have a see the when when once youth invest in education uh, they have a job preference for for jobs which are well paying reasonably well paying which offer good conditions of work and which offer stability it so happens that in our country white collar jobs have all these characteristics and blue collar jobs have none of these characteristics so there, there therefore there is a preference for white collar jobs if blue collar jobs were to begin to have these characteristics in other words if they became well paying if they became stable the gap between white collar jobs and blue collar jobs would go down and student and and educated youth would also not mind doing some of those jobs you know would not mind but at the present the gap is just too large so there is a clear preference for white collar jobs rahul has asked government jobs are still regarded as a premium in our nation he came across an article recently in which the author opined that reducing the number of attempts placing hard caps on multiple government entrance exams can this be a plausible solution in mitigating the rampant unemployment among those who are graduates at the very least also is it safe to assume that this will forcibly make them pivot to private jobs or will it increase cases of distressed unemployment uh, although it is very distressful to see young people 
repeatedly you know uh, compete for jobs in the public sector and sometimes at the end of it not get any job uh, that they aiming for i think uh, it would be an artificial uh, constraint if you were to limit the number of uh, attempts that they can make uh, uh, because uh, already those attempts are limited by an, an upper age ceiling in these jobs but i think uh, it's very likely that if you were able to, if you were to reduce the number of attempts it is very likely that the distress in the job market would increase it would not decrease so i i would not, not argue for uh, for uh, reducing the number of attempts which they can make um, although i understand that it does involve a lot of uh, pressure on them uh, but the pressures would exist even if we reduce the number of jobs because as you rightly say uh, they would they could be looking for jobs uh, which don't exist in the private sector so the situation of distress could well continue or could well intensify a question from ravindra kumar sir can controlling the population now can solve the problem of unemployment in future the answer is no uh, unemployment population and uh, this this is a, a a mistaken understanding it also exists in some sections of government uh, uh, we uh, this this notion existed before we had any understanding of demographic dividend or any understanding of demographic transition we now know it for a fact that as development proceeds fertility rates go down very remarkably with development with the uh, education and so on and so forth and we also know that in our country many states now have below replacement levels of power of of, of fertility that the fertility transition has happened demographic transition has happened so and the remaining states also fertility rates are going down very rapidly so i don't think controlling population is an issue any longer another question from emil in today's the hindu editorial it had an article written by ashok modi who teaches at princeton university in which he said about the large and widening household and individual debt and that the financial service industry with many nbfcs and other lending firms holds a quarter of the gdp since a decade and that the increasing debt with people will eventually lead to big economic crisis so he would like to know about your thoughts on this issue uh, uh, frankly i am not f- familiar with the amount of debt that private individuals hold uh, uh, from the nb nbfcs so let me bypass this question uh, i understand that nbfcs are holding a lot of uh, uh, a lot of debt which is true Uh, and the government is trying to regulate the 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 debt that they hold how much of it is household debt and individual debt and what kind of crisis it leads the households and individuals to i am not actually familiar with that so we have one more question that is how do wage standards in the service sector and other major employment providing sectors impact the indian employment landscape uh wage standards are basic standards wage standards there is an issue and uh, there is an argument that if you set wage standards then then uh, you uh, you can reduce employment because you know it's a question of demand and supply and if you raise uh, uh, if you arbitrarily raise uh, wages then you know the um, demand for employment could go down and wages could go down um but on the other hand the the uh, as long as wages are not raised arbitrarily and as long as there is a careful moderation of wage increases uh, the data which uh, which is there including data from other countries data from the us and all that uh, seems to suggest that an increase in minimum wages uh, doesn't deter employment doesn't really deter employment so, so moderate in, you know uh increases in in uh, in uh, wages are not not detrimental to employment increases so i think it's important that we have wage standards in the indian economy uh 
but it's of course carefully but the, but these wage standards should be carefully moderated it should not be excessive because excessive wage uh, wages would certainly lead to uh, declining employment so since we are exceeding the time limit so we have come to an end to this discussion session thank you thank you professor devishri vastava sir for an enriching and informative session on the challenges of employment it's time to appreciate the topers of their academic excellence to announce the winners i call upon dr shinu worki the head of the department uh here we announce the recipients of uh, the professor c s s kare memorial awards for the topers in the in the ma economics program for the academic year 2022-23 they are anjali elizabeth joy she is the topper of ma economics program 2021-23 then uh, there is aksa merins skaria and mary george they are jointly the toppers of the first year ma economics program during the academic year 2022-23 if aksa and mary are there uh, in the meeting uh, could you please come uh, and could you please switch on your uh, uh, video and then uh, come forward i think there is some problem uh, anyway hearty congratulations dear students on your achievements and wish you all the very best for all your uh, future efforts thank you sir thank, thank you so you. much thank you sir thank you sir to all prize winners i offer my thank you sir congratulations now i invite dr anlas karya coordinator of this annual lecture to express a word of thanks Good morning, Professor Devi Sri Bastava, and good evening to all. Before expressing my gratitude, I would like to acknowledge the profound impact of today's Professor C S Kariya Memorial Lecture on multi-dimensional challenges of employment. Professor Devi Sri Bastava's insights have been enlightening, and unbundling of the labour market figures offer a deep understanding of the labour market challenges in a complex country like India. Let me pass on the present task of proposing the vote of thanks to one and all. Our principal, Father Raji P. Kurian, who presided over this meeting, has been instrumental in shaping the academic environment of our institution. Thank you, Father, for your guidance and support in all our departmental activities. We wish to express a sincere gratitude to our keynote speaker, Professor Ravi Srivastava. who highlighted the emerging uh, features or uh, like of the dimensions of employment challenges especially the quality challenge which has genuinely enriched our understanding of the centrality of the employment issue thank you very much sir we are honored to have professor sebastian vj retired associate professor of economics from the institute of management technology gaziabad he is an esteemed alumnus he joined us today to share his reflections and memories of professor c s kariya professor c s kariya's contribution and dedication to the field of economics will forever be remembered and cherished thank you sir for representing and keeping this memory alive our sincere gratitude goes to the family members of professor c s kariya mr sabu cherian for instituting the endowment in his honor your support and presence today are greatly appreciated and we thank you for perpetuating his legacy today we are also celebrating the recipients of professor c s kariya memorial endowment and scholarship congratulations and heartfelt thanks to anjali elizabeth joy aksa marin kariya and mary george for the remarkable achievements and for joining us today we are truly appreciate the valuable presence of former principal faculty members of our department former faculty members our alumni and faculty members from other departments and institutions thank you for all of you for your valuable presence on commemorating the legacy of professor c s kariya a special acknowledgement goes to our department head dr shinu vakki for his dedication and effort in bringing eminent economists to our midst your vision and commitment 
have made this event possible. Thank you, Dr. Shin. I would like to thank all my esteemed colleagues for their unwavering support in organizing this lecture. A big thanks to our dear students for their active participation in the discussion sessions and engagements, and also the exchange of ideas of en en employment, and also your enthusiasm and encouragement are truly commendable. And I would like to thank the coordinators, student coordinators, Sneha Matthew and Mira Jos for their invaluable support. Once again, I extend my heartfelt thanks to everyone who are present here. And let me conclude to uh, continue to honor the memory and legacy of Professor C. Sitskaria through a pursuit of knowledge and excellence. Thank you all. Thank you, Anlamas. Last thank but you, not Anilama. least, I would like to thank all the listeners for this memorial lecture for making this program a successful one. Thank you all.